Good morning. We're going to look at Matthew 14, the feeding of the 5,000. Also, the uh, walking on water, which is, these are both great accounts. I think you're going to be blessed today as we go through these. And so, if you follow along in your Bibles. We're on verse 13, I believe, if I recall right. So, let's just get right into it. Maybe we're going to get right into it. There it goes. Uh, Matthew 14, you, you can read either your translation or the one that I have up here. So let's just go right around uh, verse 13, Norma. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Okay, well, let's just stop right there. So what do we got going on? What had just happened? Yeah, John's beheaded. And so Jesus immediately, and I think this is important to note, he takes time off. Uh, there is nothing wrong with that. And taking and by withdrawing solitary, I think we don't just assume, but we know what he's doing. He's praying. He's uh, communing with God uh, in his word, because that's that's just what you do. And again, it's easy for us to jump right over this, but what, what does our society teach what you do when you lose a loved one? Yeah, get over it right away and get back to work. Just let that go and, and move on. And in fact, this bothers me tremendously. And I don't mean to get on a, a soapbox here, but people are no longer doing funerals. I I absolutely do not understand it. Why, why are you just going, well, we're going to leave? and Or... I know why they use the term celebration of life. They'll say, we're not going to do a funeral. We're going to do a celebration of life. Well, what do you mean by that? Um, it, are you going to not grieve? Uh, there, there's a time to stop and pray. And if the celebration of life means go off and uh, drink beer, and uh, seriously, that term doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have, because I know some people mean something different by it. We're going to have a church service and we're going to celebrate that they believe. And if you mean that by it, that's different. But <clears throat> when I hear celebration of life, I hear we're going to have a drinking party and we're going to um, go on a cruise and and we're going to party. So that that's a whole different meaning to that term. I know some Christians use that, but they mean funeral. <laughs> so they mean a happy funeral versus a sad funeral. But to be honest, grief actually goes both directions. As a Christian, we grieve with hope. And so there is an element of celebration to it. But there's also can be sadness and hurt because this is somebody I love that I still want to be here. And so Jesus, I think elsewhere in the scripture, uh, he wept. He, he admits that this isn't right. There's pain that goes with it. So this whole withdrawing, and, and I know that's unhealthy too, if you withdraw permanently. Uh, th that's a very unhealthy grief for somebody to go off, shut the door, and never come out. But it is okay, and there's nothing wrong with a person shutting the door for a few days and praying and, and reading God's word and taking a time away from people. That's not sinful or wrong. The, the only time that it's wrong is if Jesus withdrew and then stayed withdrawn. So the king of the universe stays off for a little bit. So I, I want you to notice that that Jesus does, I think that's a big deal. So don't feel bad. You know, I've seen families, it's like, I can't stay out. You know how when you do the visitation the night before, it, 
if you do that and then everybody's talking to you and then i i've seen some that'll stand up there for four hours if you can do that great but if you can't and you need time to just stop it's okay um in fact that i i know i i know a lot of the funeral home directors at meyer brothers pretty well and they regularly will tell people you know it's okay if you go out and take a break and then come back. I know you want to see all the family That's and, and talk to everybody, but it is okay to stop for a little bit and come back. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Or, or maybe none of you have had the, the drinking party mentality that I see that more, I think, in my position. But uh, I'll, I've, I don't know how many this past year uh we've we've had some family members of the church and i'll say can i do something with you even a, a, a even a private thing at the funeral home or this and you know what they tell me we're just going to have a celebration of life we don't need you pastor <laughs> well, we've got it on our own i'm thinking well eh, okay you know there is jesus <laughs> Uh, and he would be welcome to be there. He would love to be there too, but it's that that's become very, very popular. Uh, I, how is the term used with you? I mean, you're out with people more than I am. It, what does celebration of life mean when you hear it? I'm just curious. Or, or does it mean what I'm hearing? When my brother-in-law the minister turned it into a celebration of life or when he got up there he knew him very well and said all the good points of it, the good things of his life mm -hmm. that's new okay life. so that's that's a different definition right. because he had god's word there too see that if if you mean that by it then i can see it being a good thing but what i'm hearing it mean is this drinking party where they go off and yeah yep yeah, i don't know what it was either mm -hmm. um, they are postponing a celebration of life until they're back around here in um i think it's going to be the first part of may but he passed away while he was out there. There are snowbirds every year. and Okay. Yeah. Now, I've seen that before, and I don't mind, you know, to do something later on in the summer, but some, especially our non-Christian families, they'll do something in the summer, but you know what it is? It's not a Christian service with prayers and readings. It's merely like a family reunion where you just have a bunch of food and Maybe tip your glass to them. Maybe not a full out drinking party, but a, but just a, they call it a celebration of life. So I guess it has two different meanings is what, because I've seen it like what you said too, which is different. Because the guy has turned into maybe though. I mean, I don't know. I don't. Yeah. Well, in, if, if they are, they aren't talking to us as pastors because the actual, uh, if somebody's cremated and they do a service at the church, it's completely free. I don't charge. The church doesn't charge. So it's actually, it would actually be cheaper to do it at the church than somewhere else. Uh, That's just us. Parents that I mean, they're, they're, they are paid yeah well i i don't know how many yeah no they do that still here too they build it in and then i i show up and i say you know if you give money to me i'm gonna give it to uh, something else because i don't accept any money for the funeral um, neither does the church now it is appropriate to pay the organist because they're they're doing work there 
but the church actually pays me to do the funeral. So why would why would you pay me a second time? Yeah, it's my job. Uh, so you don't accept a fee for any funeral? No, never. Uh, in fact, uh, if I did, uh, the way I was taught, I would be, uh, well, for one thing, I'd have to pay taxes on it. <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of, uh, it is. Now, I do know some other denominations, their pastors live off of those fees because their church doesn't pay them virtually anything. And so if they didn't get paid for a funeral, they would be literally broke uh, because they don't get paid uh, very, very minimal. Um, so it is a little bit different in other denominations. So so that's why our, our church. Uh, so whenever somebody gives me money, they all half of them do because it's built into the packages. Um, that money actually all goes to the church. Uh, and for various projects and things, because uh, us, I, as far as I know, almost all of us pastors in the Missouri Senate don't accept it. There might be a few that do, but the funeral home automatically has all the stuff that you need. Yep, they do. They they pay those. Yep. But it's all good. Me. Yep, and so. If a family come to me, and, and I, I always say that at the, the thing, I'll say, well, if you want to, if it's already built in, you tell me where you want it to go. I'll uh, I'll send it where, if you want it back, you can have it back because it's, I don't accept it. Uh, and a lot of people just give it to help people in need. That's I say, well, if you want it to go to something at church, we just do that. But uh, Weddings are different. Weddings are not part of my job description. So if they want to get married here, they ought to pay me. <laughs> it's yeah, weddings different. A wedding is a civil matter. Yes, we do it before God. However, it's there's all the premarital counseling. Um, I, I do that kind of just because, but yeah, they're supposed to, because it's a civil matter, um, it's, they could go to a judge, they could go to others, then it's, that's a little bit different. I mean, if somebody doesn't pay me, I'm not going to worry about it, but it's, it's, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a different sort of thing. And but like if somebody asks me to preach at something, I don't charge for that because it's the gospel's free. Um, but weddings are different. Why? Because they're a lot of work. <laughs> Not church work. They're, you know, you got to work on getting the, figure out how you're going to get dressed down the aisle and all that stuff, the details um, that go with it. So anyway, that. Kind of interesting. But going back to this, Jesus withdrew solitary. And, and I think that's, it's okay to do that, to take time out, to spend time with God. So, and notice though, but what does Jesus do? This, this is big deal. Verse 14. When Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. So even though he needed time to go away, he did jump right back into things and he cared about people. So because you could argue, I'm grieving right now, leave me alone. But he still cared for people, even, even in a pretty tough time. So, okay, let's, let's keep going. Uh, Dwayne? Go on. Oh, go on. Well, let's uh, let's go fifteen sixteen. Okay. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, "This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food." Jesus replied, "They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat." Okay, uh, one more. We have here only five loaves of bread, and two fish. The answer. Okay, what's going on here? 
Yeah, the crowds are getting hungry. So, so what's the logical thing to do? Send them away. Yeah, that's the logical thing that you would do. And, and I actually agree with the disciples. That makes sense. You, you, yeah, exactly. Go. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's no food out there. And so they're just looking at the situation saying, well, we can't really do anything. They're getting hungry. They need to go. So what Jesus does, remember what I said about this entire section? He is teaching his disciples here. This isn't merely, eh, let's see what's going to happen, but he's deliberately teaching. So if you look at, whoops, oh my, oh no. Sorry, I just stepped on the power pack and a little smoke came up. Okay. What lesson was Jesus teaching here? Uh, I believe he's teaching them to rely on God. That's the that's the big thing. He's showing them, yeah, that he's going to take care of it. Now, from our perspective, you send them away, and that's how you're going to care for them. They're they're. I think the disciples are not being stupid. They're they actually care about these people, just as Jesus does. But he's going to do uh, to rely on God here. And this is, I think, a great passage to talk about uh, what we call the ministerial use of reason versus the magisterial use of reason. And I, I know I've taught this before, but just a little bit of review. The ministerial use of reason is where we submit to God and trust that he's going to provide. Um, and, and a good example of this is our doctrine of miracles. Uh, ministerial use of reason would say, God, okay, you do miracles. I will trust it. These are accurate. So you're going to feed all these people. Yep, you can do it. I'm not worried about it. Magisterial use of reason would say, uh, this makes sense, however, that you're going to send them away because there's no way we could feed them out in the middle of the wilderness. So it's putting yourself over the situation. And so, so for example, Jesus dying on the cross and rising again, that's impossible. For, so therefore, it didn't happen. So when you put yourself over the situation, it's you're the majesty. Or maybe you believe Jesus died and rose, but you take the Lord's Supper, and we believe Jesus' body and blood are really present there, and we use ministerial use of reason. God, you say you're there? I believe you are, because you said you are. Magisterial use of reason would say, well, that's bread and wine. It doesn't make sense that it's body and blood at the same time, therefore it isn't. And it's just a symbol. So I've used my magisterial use of reason to determine he's not really there in the Lord's Supper. Does that kind of make sense? So magisterial is when you put yourself over it. Ministerial use of reason is what you put your under. It doesn't mean you're stupid. You're still using your reason, but you're, you're submitting your reason, your thought to God. Like some say represents. Correct. Yeah. So, so they would say it just represents it because it doesn't make sense. Um, likewise, the Catholic Church, in their view of the Lord's Supper, also uses magisterial use of reason. How? They say it can't be both Jesus' body and blood and bread and wine at the same time. It must be totally his body and blood. No bread and wine any longer there. So they're using magisterial use of reason as well. They look over it and say it has to be this way because of my thinking. Us Lutherans say it's both. And you ask, well, how can you say that? That doesn't make sense. It's got to be either one or the other. Well, we say, well, God can do whatever he wants. We submit to our reason to what he says. Okay. Yeah. 
So, which brings out a question, when should we be reasonable and when should we step out in faith? This is a huge debate and it can get into arguments in the church. Uh, a good example of this is building projects. Should we build a new building or should we stay where we are? We've, we've actually had that debate here. Uh, the, the magisterial use of reason would say, well, we can't afford it, therefore we should stay where we are. Ministerial use of reason may say, well, this building, um, let's build something new and we'll trust God will provide all the money for it. Which argument is correct? <laughs> Well, here's, here's the problem with what I just said. We're assuming that Jesus wants us to do something in particular, but we don't have a Bible passage that says, thou shalt build that building. If we had that Bible passage, then you would simply submit to it and go do it. So it's a little bit more complicated when, we're, when you make an argument like that. Should we tr go step out in faith? Or should we look around and say, well, maybe we should figure out how much money we have before we step out on faith? To be honest, a lot of times it's a little of both sides when today, and a lot of prayer, that God will make it clear what he wants us to do. I think a good example where we do have some uh, word of God is calling a pastor, like we just talked about a bit ago, and pray. We stepped out in faith, trusting that God will provide the right one, even though we didn't do a true interview or see what they're really like, or that that's stepping out in faith, that God will really place the one he wants. And they aren't going to be this hair pastor that's going to um, have a big sledgehammer and make us everybody feel horrible and and drive everybody away. There's always that fear, but you have to trust that God's going to actually do something good. Or how about this? Doing a new ministry in your own life. Maybe you invite the neighbor over to your house. That takes a stepping out of faith, or maybe it doesn't because they're easy to have over. But, or praying for somebody that you have not ever prayed for. Like your neighbor says, I'm sick. And then you say something like, I'm going to pray for you. That can take some faith to say that. Um, stepping out. Magisterial use of reason might say, if I do that, they'll never talk to me again. Ministerial use of reason would say, well, maybe the Lord has put this situation in my presence so I can witness to him at such a time as this, kind of like Queen Esther approaching King Xerxes. That that's a is this such a time as this? Or inviting somebody to church? That's hard. Um, in the use of reason, maybe you can think of some other examples than this. But I think that Jesus is teaching them a little bit of this in this verse. Uh, notice the disciples, this is a remote place, it's already getting late, send the crowds away. That's magisterial use of reason. I agree with it. Um, but Jesus is growing them here. He says, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. I, I have to laugh at that because you know they're going to fail because he said that. <laughs> you give them something to eat. Well, if they give them something to eat, it's not going to go well, right? Is, isn't the point of this passage that it needs not to be them, but God gives them something to eat? Uh, and, and I like their answer. We only have five loaves and two fish. Okay. This is a painting I saw. This is kind of neat from Africa, the, the feeding of the 5,000. I thought that's really neat. Um, but they've got all the the baskets, they're picking up the loaves in the Sea of Galilee. 
Um, I, I couldn't find the author of this, but I really like the painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of, lot of colors. Okay, Gretchen, you up for reading? I think we're on 18. And, <laughs> and he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Okay, let's, let's talk about there's some really important things in here. Remember I said it's a lesson about provision. And look at the words that are used, and this is on purpose. Notice they he fed them all, so he's going to provide. Oh, you know, a lot of times we, we say pray for what you need, not what you want. Were you taught that growing up? That was a big lesson I was taught. Yet Jesus here violates that. He doesn't give them just what they need. He also gives them what they want, which is really interesting. So Jesus goes above and beyond. So he could have just given them bread and water, and that would have been good, but he gives them fish too. After all, fish is a little more expensive. That's good. Although that was their daily food. So um, they had a lot of fish there. The other thing I want to point out that's really interesting is this right here. So he takes the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, or your translation, how did it say it, uh, gave a blessing? He looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Okay, said a blessing, and which is the same as to give thanks. So in other words, where's Jesus going to look for the provision? Yeah, not from himself, but his father. So he's teaching them that when it comes to the impossible, you do not do it. You go to God. So he was telling him to do it, but this is how you do it. You're going to look up to God to be able to give it. And that's why they're called disciples yet, learners, and they gave them to the people. Okay, just one other note. This is kind of trivial, but I, I think it's on purpose. But after they pick up the, uh, the basketfuls, in other words, he gives them more than they need, there are, well, where are they? Oh, there's 12 of them. Why 12? Yeah. So, and you also have to look where he is. This is Jewish land. You'll find when we do the 4,000, there's not going to be 12 baskets. There's going to be, what is it, seven? Uh, but the reason 12 is because there's 12 tribes of Israel. There's 12 apostles. And this is the number of completeness as well in the Bible. And, and so that any Jewish person would know this, that God is showing that he provides for all 12. And what big feeding event happened in the Old Testament where he took care of all 12 tribes? Yeah, manna from heaven. So Jesus is showing that he is able to provide for the people just as Moses uh Prayed for that provision in the Old Testament as well with the, the quail and the, uh, the bread, the manna from heaven. So he's going to take care of the whole 12. I, I, I think that's not accidental that that's mentioned here. Um, so the women and the children. Okay, this is stupid, but I had to do it. <laughs> Okay. Sorry. Anyway. So so we got provision, we have satisfaction. You take your Bible for a second. I didn't put these in here, but uh turn to Exodus chapter 16.
Okay. These are some very famous verses. Uh, I'll just read a little bit here. It says, The whole Israelite community set out from Elim. El um, I think Elim is means the, the city of the gods. Um, and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after he had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died in the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we had sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. You have to laugh at that. They have this is called nostalgia to the the nth degree. Didn't they forget they were slaves in Egypt and working seven days a week, nonstop, making I, I just watched a thing that suggested that each Israelite had to make about 4,000 bricks um, in their assembly lines. It was not good. They weren't sitting around eating food. Uh-uh. They, they just got bad memories. Okay. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that bread that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. And of course, the Israelites screw this completely up. They they gather too much on the first day, and then it, it goes bad, gets maggots in it. And then on the sixth day, when they're supposed to gather the double amount, they only gather enough for one day, and then they don't have anything to eat at the six. So there's a lot of uh, not or trust and then of course the famous verse in Deuteronomy you shall not uh, live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God and that's a great commentary on this of of trusting in God that he will not only provide the bread you need but also the the word of God and strength and and we could look at John six fifty four as well that's this is the account where Jesus feeds the 5,000, but then he says to him that I am the bread of life. So he teaches this lesson, I'm the provider here, and I'm going to take care of you. You'll recognize this verse right away when you see it. Um, this is one of those... I. If you don't have a memory work verse lately, this is a good one to memorize. Let's see. I apologize. Do you have it, Tom? Yep, 654. I'll let you read it there. Um, Can you find it? Yeah, good deal. So he's just fed the 5,000. Now, this isn't Matthew's point, but you can see how Jesus uses this right after to show, you know, you eat this, but if you eat of my word, and, and it's the same point of Deuteronomy. He was feeding him in the wilderness with the bread, but the ultimate, after all, why, why did Jesus do this miracle other than they were hungry? He didn't want to simply dismiss them, and then they're going to miss out on the word of God. So it, it's very practical, too. So I think there's a little deeper lesson here that, that the reason we might go above and beyond to feed is so that people hear the word of God. Hence, why do we do potlucks and, and dinners on Lent? By the way, this is a, a crude commercial for next week. We have spaghetti. <laughs> so come next week and uh, I think Julie Bardo's cooking. So uh, Julie and Denny and Carol and who all? Yeah, Randy Mevius and yeah, outreaches is cooking so but why do we do that meal not 
not just to eat, but to so that we can hear God's word. Um, and by the way, service will be about 35 minutes afterwards. You can put me to it. <laughs> Last night we had communion and got done in about 45 minutes. So so we, we are trying to keep them short and to the point. So maybe I was 48. I... <laughs> yeah. So but but they're we only looking at one verse each week or two. Okay. So keep in mind he's teaching them. So this next account is same thing. Uh Sharon, you up for reading a couple of verses? Immediately Jesus came to the disciples who had taken the boat, go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. Okay, good. Um, so immediately. Why immediately? So he's just got done feeding all these people, and then immediately he sends the disciples. I think there's a few things going on here. What just happened? John the Baptist just got beheaded. I, I think you can't forget that here. They still need some time. And notice what Jesus is doing. He continues the praying that had begun earlier, that got interrupted, remember? The crowds were around him. He didn't ignore him. He healed him, and then he's going to feed him. But then they're going to still take some more time because I, I think they need that. So he's, uh, but what it, the disciples, they he tells them to go ahead. You go ahead. And there's a really good lesson in life here too. I think the Lord says to this, us, this same word very often. You go ahead, you do the thing that needs to happen. And by the way, Jesus will catch up. He always does. Might not be right away, but he will eventually be there. We may have to be patient with him. But he goes up, and um, and so he takes this time on the mountain. And this is a theme in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that, of him going on the mountain. That's his favorite place to, to pray. Um, and I use the illustration. I think I've done. I'm going to keep stepping on that power supply. I'm going to be smoking. Yeah. Okay. It must be okay because it hasn't done it again. Actually, now I smell it. Okay. It's, I think it's hot. Yeah. So there's times to be up with God. There's times to be in with God's people. And then there's times to be out in the world. And this is a really good balance. You, you want to have all. If you spend all your time up with God, that's not healthy. If you spend all your time in with other Christians, that's not healthy. If you spend all your time out in the world, that's not healthy either. And people tend to fall in one of those categories. But a good balance is kind of a rotating mix of this. Spend time up with God, then with, your, with fellow Christians, and then out in the world. But you've got to go back up again. You can't stay in one spot permanently. And if one area is weak in your life, then move the other way with the help of others. But I want to point out also, when you go out in the world, you don't go alone. It's You always see Jesus going with his disciples, the disciples with him. So to be out here by yourself is dangerous. That's why we always tell uh, students going to college, make sure you find a college campus ministry. Don't be an island by yourself or a boat boat without any others because you will sink. Uh, you need fellow Christians uh, to be with you. Um, okay, so later that night he was alone. Uh, Jesus prays. Is Yeah, I was going to ask the question, is there time to pray? Yeah, there is. Well, we got to keep going. We got to get to the conclusion of this. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. 
shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Okay. This is kind of interesting. The lake is actually attacking the boat. If you literally look at it, it doesn't say uh, that the, the, let's see, I think the word, I think I wrote, wrote it down. The literal uh, buffeted means to torment, kind of like a person tormenting their brother or sister. It's, it's pounding on it is kind of the point. It's almost as personified uh, that he's doing this. But I want you to notice something that the disciples are not afraid this time. Did you notice that? The last time they were out on the water and there was a storm, they were afraid. They learned something. <laughs> Until they saw Jesus walking on the water, then they become afraid. Oh, uh, Ramona? Whoops. Yeah. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Okay. So I, I think the um, last time they were afraid of the water. I think they learned the lesson not to be afraid of the water anymore because Jesus is with them. Um, he'll take care of them. So there's this progression of learning going on in the book. But when they see Jesus walking on the water, they think he's a ghost. And so now they're afraid. This this is new. Um Keep on. I'll have Gloria read this next one. But Jesus made the place said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Okay. Now, we don't have time to go into this, but the Greek here is not it is I. The Greek is ego a me, which doesn't mean it is I. It means literally, he says, take courage. I am. If you look it up in the other Gospels, it doesn't say that. It says more like, it is I. And then, don't be afraid. And I think Jesus is deliberately saying, did you guys forget already? I'm the guy from the Old Testament that appeared to Moses at the burning bush and said, I am? Look how Jesus or Peter answers it. Um, whoops. Uh, Carol? The Lord, if it is you, tell tell me. Tell, tell me to come to you on the water. Okay, so uh, Peter actually answers it, not if it is you, but if you are. In other words, he's acknowledging what Jesus said. Um, he's saying, I am, and he's saying, uh, if you are. In other words, you're the, the I am guy. And I might be overplaying this a little bit, but I don't think I am. Uh, it's, uh, I think he's, because who is able to walk on the water? No one. But God's able to do that. Um, and so he, and then 29, we'll let you finish out. Tom, he said, when Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. Okay. We're going to stop here. It is 11 o'clock, but we'll talk about, uh, because again, we're talking about faith that God provides, and Peter's going to end up walking on the water. And of course, I was in that comic site. We've got a lot of verses to uh, do, so I had to. Uh, <laughs> well, sorry. <laughs> This is from Reverend, Reverend Fun. Yeah, so, but let's close with a prayer. Uh, and th there's a couple of lessons, I, I think, for all this, though, that there's this progression of faith. G Jesus, they're learning not to be afraid of this and trusting in Jesus, but then you get a new thing that happens. And then to go above and beyond to care for people, Jesus is teaching them that too, but it's got to come from God. Um, and likewise, they got to remember who he really is. This is this is God that's that's come to them on the water. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you continually were teaching your disciples to uh, for provision. 
help us to trust that you will constantly provide as well in our life, no matter what we go through, that it might not be immediate, but that you are there. And Lord, help us, especially as there's been many losses lately, to, to grieve, but grieve trusting in you for your provision. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.